vamos a ser parte de esta gran nación. Eh, ese puede ser la... ¿Qué tal amigos? What's up guys? Ya estamos de regreso aquí en el canal de la verdad de True Chano, el único canal que le trae noticias verdaderas en su idioma y al momento. Si usted no habla inglés, por favor, quédese con nosotros para que practique su inglés. And if you don't speak Spanish, please stay with us so you can practice your Spanish. Uh, so, Ignacio, uh, we did an interview, an awesome interview last time. Yeah, it was uh, really good. As Trump would say, a perfect, a, it was perfect. It was a perfect interview. It was a perfect interview, perfect call, perfect everything. <laughs> But uh, we did it in Spanish, so now we're going to do it in English. I've been seeing what you have been tweeting, and I, I retweet your stuff here and there. Thank you, yeah. And, and you have a, a, a little bit of a different approach, but it, it, it really makes sense. Uh, uh, and this liberal list, uh, liberalismo, in, in English, how do you say that in English? Liberalism? Liberalism, yeah. But what, so, are you, what, what exactly are you referring to, though? The destruction of America. You know that I... No, that's I, neoliberalism. Ne okay. Yeah. That's, okay. Uh, that's an economic model. I mean, it's not really something well-defined. It's just a general concept of, of a sort of philosophy in economics, like a globalization is a concept, a general concept. Uh, free trade is a general concept. And that's a part of the... Uh, the neoliberalism, it's where the private industry wants less government in everything. And that sounds good, but once you get into the details, as they say, the devil is in the details, then you start seeing real big problems because the industry, you know, big industry starts having control of the economy, absolute control. And so that's where the real problem starts. Now, something that catch my, my attention there is you, 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 uh, tweeted this picture where you have this home in Texas that's like $200,000, and then you have a smaller house in San Jose that's a million dollars. Yeah. Then you have gas that is $2 in Texas and four something here. And, and we are supposed to be a, a, a rich state, right? We're supposed to be a bigger, be a bigger economy. Yeah. So, so how, does, how does that work? Why is it if, you would have, if we are a better economy, Uh, it's so expensive. Well, in California, if we start with the homes, it's all about regulation. In California, the what Texas builds in one year in homes, you know, the number of homes that Texas builds in one year, California builds in 10. So there's much less uh, a product on the market which drives the price up, and that's intentional. Uh, they don't build that many homes anymore. Uh, that's intentional because what they want to build are apartments. So everything is designed so that the apartments are, they cost more, the houses they cost more, and it's sort of like controlling the market, kind of like a monopoly, so that cities uh, can collect more income or, uh, you know, property tax and what have you. So ultimately, it's not about the size of the economy. It's the control you have over your economy within that state. And uh, states like Texas, Uh, where you, uh, you, you don't even pay uh, state income tax, for example, they have a lot less regulation, and you can build homes, you can uh, have larger properties, and it, it, it's not a problem because the cities are welcoming a lot of development. In California, everything is controlled, super controlled. You can't develop anything. It takes you five years, six years, just to go through the process to get something approved. And after five or six years, you might not even get it approved, but you have to go through the whole process. So everything is more expensive, and that's what drives the cost up. Now, when you have uh, Gavin Newsom, that he starts talking and he starts saying that we are the fifth largest economy, uh, that we are the most anti-Trump state, and that we have all kinds of good stuff going on. But what <laughs> I see, but what I see is a bunch of homeless. The other day that we went to the March for Life. After the march, we went to eat at a Vietnamese restaurant. Uh -huh. And on the way in, outside the restaurant, there's this people shooting heroin, and one almost died there. And, and I'm supposed to ignore that person and go and have my, my, my dinner. And it, it was something very hard for me to, to deal with. Wow, that's uh Well, you know, San Francisco, 
I mean, what can I tell you? It's like a third world. There are junkies everywhere. People are going poo everywhere. Uh, it's very dangerous, very violent. It's very ugly now. You know, I, I try to stay away from San Francisco, quite frankly. I mean, you invited me to that thing. And, you know, being on the streets in San Francisco with all the weird uh, liberal Democrats, you know, I preferred not to go. <laughs> but you, you, if when you get elected, you're going to be three districts away from there, right? I mean, you, you're within driving distance. Yeah, I mean, it's like 45 minutes from here. Uh, the Part of the problem... Uh, is that San Jose already has those problems. Uh, a lot of the, what you're showing on the street, I mean, San Jose has a lot of that, a lot of that. Here in, in this area, we have something, I think it's five to 7,000 homeless. I think, I mean, if I, if I remember the numbers correctly, it's more or less in that area, uh, the number. So that's a lot of homeless. I mean, it's one of the largest homeless populations in the entire country. And the entire state of California has like 150,000. So we're inundated, San Francisco, San Jose, or, or Santa Clara Valley uh, County, Los Angeles County, all the coastal cities, they have the bulk of the homeless. So, yes, it is a big problem. But, you know, I, my, my whole strategy is sort of not only to be a candidate, the official candidate for the Republicans, but also help reorganize the party because there's really nothing going on at the local level at the ground zero level to do anything, organize Republicans, get the word out, uh, get people involved in local government that want to change these things. I mean, it, there really isn't. So I'm going to have to be involved at that level as well as an activist and or and a party organizer if I really want to make a change uh, to, to this area, at least. Maybe not all of California, but at least I'll start here. And maybe hopefully in other areas of California, they'll start, you know, picking up some different ideas. Is the people that you're going to represent, the people of District 19, are they uh, afraid that you're going to inherit some of this, uh, <laughs> some of some of this craziness? Because San Jose, uh, Silicon Valley, it's very expensive as well. So oh. soon you're going to have people that can't afford to leave. So they, but they don't want to leave this the city either. So they'll just stay on the streets. I, I was actually I was at the Facebook headquarters. Uh huh. Uh, Menlo Park. Menlo Park. Or was it in? Uh, I think there's another one in Mountain View. I might have, yeah, I might have been the Google headquarters. Or, there, I saw many people living in RV parks. RVs yeah. parked on, on the street. You go to a nicer part of town, in San Jose, in Cupertino, in uh, you know near Palo Alto, uh, Sunnyvale, Campbell you know, the nicer parts of Silicon Valley. And people are living in their mobile home, in their cars, you know, mostly more mobile homes, because the rents are just so high. But I mean, these are, this are not mobile parks. This is No, the they're on the street. They're right, on the right. street, like by a park, uh, near a bathroom, uh, because they really have no other options. And most of these people have good paying jobs. Which is the surprising thing. I mean, a lot of these people are making over sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year, which is amazing to me because those are awesome jobs anywhere in the country. But here in Silicon Valley, uh, the rents are so high that that type of job just barely gets you by. And if you have an issue with health care, uh, you know, one of your kids gets sick, you get sick, bam, you're out on the street. That's I mean, it's that simple. If, if the homes are like the home that you tweeted, you know, the $900,000 house, if you purchase that house, even if you put 20% down, your mortgage is almost $9,000 with taxes and everything. So you yeah. will have to make, I don't know, maybe close to $25,000 a month to be able to afford comfortably that type of a home. And, and that's the problem with most of California, especially here. That's why they control development so that the people that own properties, you know, the... Uh, the apartment building owners can maintain a a a market, a monopoly over the market, and people have to rent their properties. So that's how, I mean, you make it impossible to own a home. So what do you have to do? You have to rent, and you're stuck there. You're stuck there for the rest of your life because you really can't save 20% for that down payment. I mean, you can't. Most people can't, especially for the prices here. It's impossible for most people.
you know, I remember a while back when I was uh, very active in the mortgage industry, I did a lot of loans in San Jose, and uh -huh. and I remember that a lot of this uh, uh, people that were buying homes, uh, uh, they were buying them two hours from San Jose because they couldn't afford to live there. You're talking teachers, uh, uh, police officers. Yeah. They couldn't afford the communities they protect. Yeah. They couldn't yeah. afford the communities in which they teach. Yeah. That's, that's very true for San Jose. A lot of people live outside the city. Uh, unfortunately, if you want to buy in this city, you have to make you know, at least, at least about above a hundred thousand, at least, and and saved for a bunch of years, or you know, above one fifty, two hundred k, to have a a real option to buy a house, be able to pay the down, you know, make the down payment, and what have you. But it's really complicated. I mean, the 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 market is designed so that you do not own a home, you rent, and that's the problem. That's the big problem in California. That's their strategy, and we have to change that. You know, the, the right has to change that. The Republicans have to change that. And uh, right now we have a president that can bring a lot of us Trump Republicans into office and make these changes because California, let me tell you, I have a lot of issues with the California GOP. You know, I, I, I crash with a lot of uh, the ideas in that party. Well, you know, our party, because they really sound like Democrats in a lot of things. And and they don't support the president openly, you know, maybe behind closed doors where a lot of us Republicans get together. Oh, yeah, the president, the president, the president. Yeah, we love him. We love him. But out in public? Yeah, nothing, nothing. I mean, they even tell me, no, no, don't campaign as a Trump Republican. That's bad. That's bad. I mean, yeah, think about that. <laughs> That's California Republicans. The, well, the, the structure, you know, the people that are operating the party, not actual Republicans out there voting. Have, have they reached out to you? Are they, are they supporting you? Are they have they uh, officially endorsed you? Or no, uh, they can't endorse me right now until after the the uh, the primary because there's two Republicans inside the 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 primary for this district. But the the organization is so bad that there's no way for us as two people challenging uh, or looking for the nomination within our party for this district to sort of have debates. Uh, meet with the party structure and present our ideas and then have the party support one of us. And there's, it's like, you know, whatever, you know, whoever comes out uh, after the primary, maybe we'll do something for you, maybe. I mean, there's, there's no guarantees. The best contact that I've received is uh, just before the registration. Um, uh, what's it? Uh, I forgot his name right now. He's the, 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 the most powerful Republican in the House, um, McCarthy. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, his office contacted me and asked me if uh, if I was going to register, if I was going to be on the ballot, because they represent the RNCC, which is the Republican National Congressional Committee. They help all the people running for office uh, to get funding and what have you and support during the campaign. But that'll be after the primary. So right now, if, if I get uh, on the ballot for November, the general election, then I will have some party support. But ultimately, I have to run as a Trump Republican. I can't run as a California Democrat uh, Republican, which is the same thing almost. <laughs> so, so uh, because I always call them Democrats, so that's why you know. Because, I mean, it's true. If you go to Instagram and check the California GOP, how they endorse everybody, they're all their logos are blue. I mean, everything is blue in that uh, Instagram. I mean, there's some like a little red check mark. But everything looks like a Democratic page. I mean, it's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check it so, out on Instagram. <laughs> but what do you want to tell Americans? What do you want to? What do you want to? One is uh, you're Hispanic, so you want to obviously wake up Hispanics. But what do you want to tell us? How can we? How can we help you? And how how can we help ourselves here in California? Well, you know, we need to take control of the political process. And my message is about getting involved. My book, The America First Doctrine, talks about, uh, you know, who are we? Who are the Trump Republicans? And part of that message is that we have to be involved at every level, in every election, for every office. So we have to get involved. We can't just vote and say, you know, we did our part. We have to be involved on everything because... Being sort of a, a Republican and just voting, look what, where it's taken us. California is blue because 
we haven't participated. The party hasn't been able to organize the people. It doesn't really have a vision for the for the Republicans in California or the policy. So my core message is we need to take control of our lives and take control of this uh, political process and get involved. That's the bottom line. You know, we need to get involved. You know, in this channel, I was on a debate with another with a de Democrat leader in, in Florida. Uh -huh. uh, he's not very happy with the Democrats either, but still, I, I, as, as a Californian, I was, I was, you know, just I was playing the game, uh -huh. and, fi and finally he pushed back to me, and he said, "Marco, you know what? You guys in California, you should be red. Uh -huh. I don't understand why, with having forty percent Mexican descent, you know, all these conservatives, why are you guys blue? Be yeah. Because you got you do zero outreach." Uh, 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 in the Republican uh, Party for for Hispanic Americans. Yeah. Uh, now there's a big wave where Trump's going to be in Phoenix. He's going to be in uh, Las Vegas, and mm. he's going to be in, in, in uh, what is it, uh, Bakersfield. Yeah. How can we har uh, harness a little bit of that? Uh, do you think we should go and welcome the president in Bakersfield or with a big? Yeah. Party? It, let's go. Let's go have fun. You know, that's a good idea. We should go. Uh, I was thinking about that. Uh, definitely count me in. <laughs> we'll go. <laughs> I mean, it's only like three hours from here driving. We can we can bring the Latinos for Trump flag there and, and yeah, I'll bring one of my banners. You know, it'll be cool. Because I think we 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 need to show Trump that look. California has a lot of Trump supporters. I think if you put all the California Trump supporters, if you count them, you have enough to fill three red states, three of the small red states. There's a yeah. lot of us. There, there's a lot. And one of the statistics that a lot of people don't uh, know is that California has the most individual donations to the Trump campaign in the entire country. I mean, more people from California have donated to the Trump campaign than from any other state. So a lot of people here are supporting the president. The problem was also that they redistricted uh, a bunch of years ago and made everything in favor of the Democrats. I mean, they really screwed us in terms of the districts. But that's just one of the realities uh, when uh, the GOP doesn't organize and doesn't get people involved in local politics or in state politics. So. It's, it's a big challenge. One of my, uh, I was mentioning to you a while back about the, the uh, super PAC that we want to start, which is essentially going to be something like, you know, turn California red, get Latinos into, uh, into, into politics and on the conservative side. And, we're, you know, whether I, I'm, I win the primary or not, or, you know, I'm in, on the ballot for November, we're going to start that process after March 3rd. Because we need to do fundraisers with the president, with uh, Don Jr., with Ivanka Trump, and get that core uh, Republican support that really supports our president really activated in this state. Because I know we can win a lot of the blue districts that are uh, in California. The problem is getting organized. Uh, you know, they just they're not they're not organized. The, the the party doesn't do anything locally. I mean it's it's. Everything the party has done since I arrived in uh, in San Jose to be act politically active this time was the Christmas party, <laughs> uh, a barbecue where, they, where, where, where the barbecue was like you have to pay fifty bucks to come to the barbecue. So who the hell is going to go to a barbecue, uh, pay fifty bucks to see uh, the 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 chairman of the party? Uh, Jessica, I forget her name. Uh, who's going to pay fifty bucks for that? You know, except the little group of Republicans that go to the same events. Normal Shoot. Republicans are not going to go. That was cheap here in Contra Costa. It was one hundred and fifty. Well, maybe it was one hundred and fifty. I don't remember. But it, <laughs> I mean, the point is, uh, it's 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 a ridiculous way to organize your base because nobody is going to go. Spend 150 bucks, 50 bucks, for a barbecue uh, to meet uh, Jessica Patterson. Yes, Patterson. Nobody. And no one is going to do that. So what what happens? You have a big separation from the people that organize the party and the people that actually vote. 
big separation ideologically and uh, socially, I'm guessing, as well. You know, there is a great... Um, I interviewed Guadalupe Salazar. She uh -huh. is uh, a write-in candidate for House uh, District 21 uh, here in, in, uh, in the Central Valley. Uh-huh. Uh, and you know what she told me? She told me that there's 21 seats, uncontested seats, on the Republican side. On the Republican side? Uh-huh. No, on the Democratic side. We're, right, right. We're, we're not contesting them. Like, the, the, there's just no Republicans running. Well, this seat last time, two years ago, was essentially uncontested because the, the person that ran as a Republican was a write-in ballot. And because he was the only Republican running, you know, he got on the ballot, as the guy was telling you about. And he he had no campaign. He didn't have anything. And uh, unfortunately, people in the party that were looking for a candidate had nothing but negative things to say about him. You know, he had no ideas. He, I mean, I don't want to talk bad about him, badly about him, but the impression they got from him was that this guy is not serious. I mean, we need people that are serious about wanting to win the election, about campaigning and taking real ideas to the people if we really want to take uh, this district. The same thing throughout California. There's a lot of districts where Democrats go uncontested because the Republican Party of California is not organizing anything. There's no way we can give them a free victory in these districts. There's just no way, but they do it. That's all they do. Well that's what I, I was actually. She is running for a house district, not not a not Congress. Yeah. Uh, but she she tells me that all she needs is a hundred votes to win. Yeah. Wow. To win her, to win her side, of course, to be to be uh, uh, the two. Uh huh. So I'm thinking like, wow. I mean, a hundred. I mean, shoot. If we get Hispanics, if we get all our cousins and all our family to to vote, I mean, that's enough. But what, I, what I'm saying, there is just not enough. I don't think there's enough enthusiasm at the local level. Uh, you know what? There hasn't been. Uh, President Trump has created a lot of enthusiasm for the Trump Republicans. You know, the ones that are really die hard. They love our president. That we really want to see him succeed. And we're, we're sort of motivated by him. Those Republicans are very active. And I call them Trump Republicans. They're very active. They're the ones that have taken... The party sort of, you know, they sort of given it to, to the president because the president has made this party his party. To me, the only reason the Republicans are as powerful as they are right now nationally, because they have the Senate, because they have the White House, is because of him. Otherwise, <clears throat> they would be they wouldn't even be united. They would be, you know, going off in different directions because they, they wouldn't have anything that brings them together. But right now, the president and this whole energy throughout the Republican establishment is for the president. And that's something we need to really sort of tap into in California, because there's a lot of it. But the GOP isn't doing anything for that. Now, if Trump got most of his uh, donations, individual donations from you, wouldn't you think that there would be more activity uh, uh, as far as Trump goes more Trump rallies, more, you know, Trump victory parties here and there? Um, you know what? No, I don't think so, because the climate is so negative in general in the country. You know, you go out on the street with a MAGA hat, uh, people are going to assault you. So people maybe just want to stay in their homes, uh, send some money to the president, and, and vote for him. Uh, but we need to make it normal to be able to go out into the streets to have a MAGA rally, to have a Trump rally, whatever you want to call it, and not worry about being harassed. So we need to make it a lot more acceptable for them to get involved. Because a lot of these people, maybe they just don't want to be out on the street, you know, yelling and, and doing whatever and promoting anything in particular, but they do want to support the Republican Party or the president, the, you know, the Trump Republican Party. So that's what we need to tap into. We can't just say the same old GOP. The same old GOP in general has a horrible image, even among Republicans. You know, they don't like it because they feel betrayed, especially here in California. Did you see the video that Anonymous uh, sent, uh, Anonymous Vickersville, 
uh, about no. uh, Trump coming to, to California. No, no that is it. <laughs> let, let, let me see if I can find it and maybe I can send it to Leo and we can put a little bit of it. Uh, uh -huh. it it's it's a it's a video that reflects a lot of the the hate, I guess. And so basically, that's why I was asking you if we should go uh, meet Trump, because they're telling us not to go. Who's they're telling, telling you not to go? The anonymous. Um, oh, well. Well, well look. Like, uh... Yeah, anonymous is, you know, that, that I actually used to like anonymous uh, because they did the... the um, um, Wall Street, they they uh, did uh, Occupy Wall Street and all yeah. that. But now the way they're making it sound is that we should be scared of going to um, uh, to meet the president. Well, they want you to be scared because they want you to think that in California, the president doesn't have support. You know, it's part of the sort of the the public relations Trump from the left. Coming to Bakersfield, California, next week in Wednesday, the 18th of February, 20. Let me send it to to Julio, and then we'll play it. And yeah, play a little bit. But yeah. you know, so as as a Hispanic candidate, are you getting uh, uh are you getting assist help from us Hispanics? <laughs> How's it going? Well, let me tell you. Uh, the 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 most difficult people to convince uh, about voting Republican, uh, you know, voting for me, are family. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's the hard. I mean, people out on the street that don't know me that are Hispanic are easier to convince than my family. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's that bad, and I don't know why. I mean, they, they're, they're just so they're so Democrat. Julio. Julio, it's called Anonymous Beckersville, message directed to Donald Trump for coming to Beckersville, California. Uh, I sent it to the email for for Julio, but I don't know if you can, if you get it. Uh -huh. uh, so, so you having, you know what? I was uh, I was in Sacramento with my dad yesterday. They just came back from uh, from from Hidalgo. Uh -huh. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they just oh, came back wow. from. They, they spent a whole month over there. They wow. went everywhere. I'm and I was telling them about you, uh, but uh -huh. but yeah, you're right. It's it's so hard to convince them. It's just I don't know how can well, we look, activate. If they're from Mexico, you have to tell them we're like the the Lopez Obrador people. You know, we're trying to change the system. Uh, we're trying to get corruption out. Uh, that's probably the best way to connect with them if they understand Mexico. But if they're just here uh, and they've been they've always been here and they're and you know they're Latinos or whatever. Uh, it's a lot harder because they just, they're just completely closed off to anything outside of what they already think they know. And uh, that's a lot because of, you know, mainstream media, everything they see on CNN, local news. It's just, I mean, they're, I don't want to say that, but they're literally brainwashed and they will not listen to anything outside of that box. Nothing. So it's really uh, hard. Actually, you know what? Al Punto with uh, um, with Ramos, Jorge uh -huh. Ramos, he had three Hispanics on his show, uh -huh. and I think I think this is the Hispanics is really good. I, I can't send it to you, Julio, because I'm 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 on, using the phone, uh, but I, I can post it on my uh, maybe I can post it on my Twitter account, and you can grab it from there. Uh, let me. I'm gonna tweet it on my Twitter account, and you grab it there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so he had these three Hispanics, and uh -huh. so it seems that Jorge Ramos is starting to soften a little bit. Do you think he he knows what's coming, or do you think he's just it's his strategy? Oh, wait, Jorge Ramos is uh, against the Democrats. No, no, he kind of well, he brought three Hispanics for Trump. Uh -huh. And and the, but the questions he asked, he said he wanted to show the other side. He said, "Well, we feel uh, an obligation to show our viewers the side that supports Trump." But well, you, you know, I think I mean I don't follow uh, Jorge Ramos uh, or I don't watch any television in Spanish, even when I was in Mexico, because it's uh, in general in Mexico it's all lies, so it doesn't matter. And in the U.S., I mean, I just don't watch Spanish television. 
But my guess is, and from what I, from the people that I know in Latin America, is that he's been getting a lot of pushback supporting the communist uh, democratic side, so to speak. You know, because a lot of people from Florida are saying, you know what, communism and the left, <clears throat> they're horrible things. I mean, you know, you know, Cuba, Venezuela, we know these things are bad, so why are you promoting them? I'm guessing it's something like that. And people are, are finally telling him that uh, he should open up to the, to the right. I, I don't know. Well, yeah, he, he had him because, you know, Trump is, like I said, there's a wave coming where Trump's coming to Phoenix, to Las Vegas, and actually yeah. that's what he, uh, he's on. So he's sort of preparing his, his audience, like saying, well, why is Trump having all this? Uh, well, you know, know, maybe his audience is going down because he's attacking Trump so much or when he was attacking him so much that he, you know, the people finally said, you know what, stop attacking him because our ratings are going, you know, to the floor. So in TV, that's always an issue. You, you know, you have to listen to your audience. Uh, CNN is losing a bunch of people. They're losing a bunch of money. But Univision, you know, you never know. Maybe it's something to do with that. Maybe they're, they're, it's a money thing. I, I mean, I really don't know. But I'm guessing it's something like that. Otherwise, I mean, it's not like he would change just because it's the right thing to do. It just seems odd to me for him to do that. So that's something that uh, people don't, I don't know if you want to tell people about that, but you have experience in politics in Mexico. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've been working in Mexico. The first time I worked in Mexico was in 1994 for a year for the Ministry of uh, Economic uh, and Industrial Development in Hidalgo uh, with uh, a, a man who later became governor of the state, and he was the 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 person negotiating uh, NAFTA for Mexico in Canada. I won't mention his name because I, I don't know what the things are about mentioning names, but uh, I mean, you can look him up. Uh, and so he invited me because I was uh, to work in Hidalgo and I worked with him for one year uh, uh, attracting investment into Hidalgo, uh, you know, um, sort of doing the whole marketing internationally of the state, uh, taking trips abroad setting up the entire investment for Hidalgo. And we brought in a lot of investment during uh, that time. And then I was invited by him for his campaign for Congress in like 96, 97. And then I was invited to his campaign in 98 after I graduated my master's uh, for his uh, campaign for governor. And then he made me advisor from 1999 to 2005. And then from then on, I just kept getting uh, more more uh, sort of a contracts to work uh, at the state level in Hidalgo and in politics. <coughs> I'm sorry. So, yeah, I've worked a long time in politics in Mexico, and it was never my idea to work down there. But, you know, one thing just led for it to another, and I, I kept being offered these positions, and so I, I, kept, I kept taking them. So would you say, because I actually did say that I wish during the Trump uh, 2016 campaign I mm -hmm. wish we would have had a couple of uh, Mexican politicians to help us fight Hillary Clinton. <laughs> you why know you why I said that? You should have looked me up. <laughs> <laughs> you know why? why, why I said, you know why I, I said that? Because Vicente Fernandez, uh, uh, Los Tigres del Norte, and all these people were campaigning for Hillary. Yeah, I mean... Uh, the, the, fortunately for the U.S., we have a an electoral college, and it's not just about the you know the absolute vote. So that was a big advantage, and I'm glad we we won because imagine Hillary being president. So I mean I don't even want to imagine that. So uh, you know you have all these people in Mexico, these celebrities uh, supporting Hillary, because Trump by mainstream media was vil vilified. You know, they made him the person that hated Mexicans, that he was a racist, that he wanted to put up a wall and keep people out because they were poor or they were just because they were Mexican or whatever. So, you know, a lot of people believed that because nobody had ever taken on mainstream media until Donald Trump came along. And he exposed them for everything that they were. I mean, Barack Obama was just a media candidate. I mean, they made him and they thought they could do the same thing with Hillary. And Donald Trump just blew them out of the water. I mean, he just exposed them for what they really are. I mean, just a bunch of Democrat operatives, honestly. 
So, you know, I, ultimately, I'm glad we, we were able to, to go beyond that. And even though there weren't any real uh, politicians from Mexico or celebrities supporting our president, we won. Uh, but if you need that for this campaign, I can help you out with that. <laughs> <laughs> we definitely need somebody like you that understands, especially when you look <laughs> at California, have all this uh, this uh, culturally rich uh, environment where Hispanics have been helping California since before California was part of the union. I mean, we, we, it is because of us that California uh, joined the union. Hispanics got together and, 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 you know, saved themselves out of all this oppression from the dons. Well, well it I mean, seems yeah, I mean, California dons. has a, a rich history, uh, you know, uh, in terms of, you know, the, the Mexican influence, the Spanish influence. But ultimately, today, what we need to do is just look to the future and see what we can do in terms of, organizing people that believe in a smaller government, they want to pay less taxes, that believe in their dream and make that a reality. Because the Democrats in California overtax, overregulate, and they keep people essentially in poverty because that helps them. And only a small group is really, uh, you know, enjoying the spoils of such a wealthy state. Julio, I sent you a one-minute video of, uh, uh, the, that uh, Ignacio created. I don't know if you have it there. But in this video, you talk about uh, hand, um, bailouts. And, and you talk about the just to go back to the neoliberalism. Neuro how does that tie in, in, in what, what's going on right now? Well, it's it's part of the problem in terms of economics. Um, in the night in the early 1970s, uh, we had a recession. Our national debt back then was like 80 billion dollars. 80 billion. Today it's what 22 trillion. <laughs> and, ri so, and rising and, and rising. rising every day. Yeah. So 800 billion, uh, you know, almost a trillion. And today it's uh, 22 trillion. So back then, no, 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 80, 80, it was 80, not 800, it was 80 billion dollars. So you know, it was nothing in that economy, in today's economy. So the, what they were looking for was a new economic model that would take them out yeah. of this recession. Okay, yeah, I look pretty good there. <laughs> There's no audio. Let me say, I don't see it, but... Okay. All right. So the the real issue is that they sold this neoliberalism uh, as capitalism, and we bought that. Is the video coming on? Neoliberalism. The God that failed. Allow me to describe something that has been going on for nearly 50 years, the destruction of America, destruction of America. Politicians from both the right and the left have given corporations free reign of our economy, and we have suffered crisis after crisis, bailout after bailout. Our president needs Trump Republicans in Congress to help him take this country back. Please help me turn this district red. I'm Ignacio Cruz, and I approve this ad. All right. <laughs> I kind of like that one. <laughs> How long did it take you to make that? Uh, a couple of days. Uh, I had to buy an editing program and learn how to do it. Uh, so uh, so what, what exactly are you saying here? What, what, what is, who is this directed to? Well, it's, it's sort of to open the, uh, you know, people's eyes that we have been sold this new economic model for the last 50 years, and it's a big lie. You know, when they say... Uh, this is efficient. We have to do it efficiently. What they're really saying is we're taking your job, you know, our job, to a country where labor is dirt cheap, and we're going to make our products there and then bring them back into the country. That's what they're really saying when they say efficiency. You know, a, the corporation has to be efficient. That's what they're really saying. They're not. They don't mean 
that you are going to keep your job. They don't mean that you're going to make more money or that you're going to pay less for your product because your iPhone and your Nikes don't cost, you know, they aren't cheaper. So they sold this model as capitalism and we believe them, but it's not capitalism. It's sort of a, uh, it's an extreme version of what you want capitalism not to be. It's what everyone before uh, the last 50 years tried to protect our people from, uh, you know, the capitalist market. Everything that was there in place to protect us from these powerful corporations was eliminated over the last 50 years. And that's why we had the housing crisis, the Internet crisis, the, the Internet bubble, the fraud with Bertie Madoff, uh, Enron, and so on and so forth, because they removed all the protections from the economy. And so corporations could do whatever they want, and they have. And that's the real message uh, about neoliberalism. It's a is, very dangerous model. Is this where the term too big to fail came from? And, and, and when you started to see these corporations, that they're bigger than most uh, uh, state governments? I mean, the huge well, corporations. You know, th this I, I kind of discovered this uh, when I was doing my B.A., uh, at USC, because I took a lot of economics courses. And then in my master's, uh, this was like 94, 98. And when I was doing the economic uh, investment, the foreign direct investment in Mexico uh, at the time, you understand what, what governments do to eliminate the barriers so corporations can do whatever they want. In Mexico, for example, a corporation comes in and says, you know what, Hidalgo, I, I want to invest in my, uh, you know, I want to put my factory in your state, but you have these laws that are protecting your workers. We need to remove those laws so that we're not liable if something goes wrong with them or that we have to pay them X amount of money. The state, the federal government, they remove the laws. And then, you know, the corporations come in and do whatever they want. And this goes around all over the world. It just doesn't just happen in the U.S. You know, the corporations are leaving the U.S. They're telling other countries how they want the laws to be so they can go in and uh, invest and basically have slaves. At, because in Mexico, you're, back then, they were making 20, 25 pesos a day. And they were making them work 15, 16 hours a day. Plus... They weren't being paid like automatically the, the 20, 25 pesos, 30 pesos a day. They were being paid by productivity. So you had to make a thousand little gadgets before you got your basic salary. It's ridiculous. So that's when I discovered this whole economic model uh, was, was really destroying. And it wasn't really what it was supposed to be uh, in terms of economics. I mean, it was just like a big lie. And it just kept growing and growing and growing. It started with Reagan. But... With Reagan, it wasn't as toxic as it is today. In the 1929 stock market crash, I think it was 29, right? Uh, I should remember those dates. <laughs> uh, there was a law passed that separated investment banks and uh, normal banks. Okay, so, you know, you, you had a separation. In 1994, 96... Uh, Clinton signed a law that eliminated that difference. And so banks, normal banks, could become like investment banks. And that's why you had the destruction in the 2009 crisis, because investment banks were acting like, uh, like normal banks and just taking all kinds of risks. And look what happened with the housing. I mean, they just created all kinds of make-believe products that didn't even really exist. <coughs> And then, you know, you had the whole uh, housing crisis, the, the, uh, the subprime crisis. I mean, that was horrendous. And then, and then to protect them, uh, what they, because they were sort of investment banks, they did another sort of a paperwork thing where they, be, they were allowed to be considered for bailout as a normal bank, not just an investment bank. So they also changed that, that, uh, that standing, and so that allowed them – to get a lot of the uh, bailout funds. And what did they do with those funds? They paid their debt. You know, all the bad decisions they made, they were able to cover all that debt and save their companies, pay their executives billions from taxpayer money. But people that lost their house because they made bad decisions or had debt, they didn't care. They lost their house. 
you know, you made a bad a purchase. There's a bite, you know, ni modo. And, right. But the, the corporation yeah. didn't get that. And they were too I big saw, to fail, uh, remember? I saw a lot of a lot of people lose their household, you know, to, yeah. to, to the housing market. It was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, a lot of people that I know, a lot of people in my family lost one or two of their properties because, uh, I mean, the from one day to the next, their, their payments just skyrocketed because everything was a lie. And it was a lie because... Regulation was eliminated. There was no oversight, and these corporations could do whatever they want. And that's the problem with neoliberalism. It gives corporations the ability to do whatever they want. I do remember, though, that some people that went through the 80s and, and had that problem that, that, that when the mortgages, mm -hmm. uh, they didn't have any cap, uh, and they lost a bunch of homes there. That's why... I used to see some people that went through that. I would say, no, I don't want any adjustable loans. I don't want any mm -hmm. Nina, any no mm -hmm. asset. I want a 30 year fix. Yeah. Uh, and, well, you were smart. <laughs> no, well, you know, well, I sold a lot of uh, adjustable rates, but uh -huh. some people would not buy them. And I would say, uh -huh. like, why? Like, no, because we, we already went through this in, in the 80s. Uh -huh. and, and, and the value of the house is just evaporated. And, and and now, how can you convince somebody that their house is not worth twenty thousand dollars because homes were being sold for twenty thousand dollars in Stockton? You cannot build. You there's no the cost replacement value of a house. It's not twenty thousand dollars. It's way yeah. more. Yeah. But people got convinced that their houses were not worth anything, so they let them go. Yeah. And the investors that bought them with foreign money, they're selling them back to the same people for four hundred thousand dollars now. That that's a scam. That's neoliberalism. The the rich okay. get richer, and the poor get poorer. I mean, that's how neoliberalism works. In my book, I go into a lot of detail, not too much because it's really complicated. But I try to simplify it, and so that people can understand the general concept of what neoliberalism has done to our economy. And that's the general concept: the rich get richer, and the poor get poorer. Period. I mean, that's neoliberalism in a nutshell. Wow. What else do you want to talk about? Um, I don't know how we're going in time here, uh, Julio, but what else do you want to talk about? How else can we help you? Well, you know, uh, this is a, a big help, you know, getting out there, getting the message out there. One thing here in, uh, in Silicon Valley is that uh, we need to reach more Latinos. I think if we get the word out to Latinos and they can understand that my policies are not sort of... Um, you know, extreme. Uh, they're, they're really about common sense economics, about helping people pay less rent, having less homeless, uh, paying less taxes, having less regulation, and how all of that will improve their lives. Uh, I think we can make a big difference here. So that's my real message, and that's how you can help me. You know, getting the message out. You know, retweeting me, uh, doing the interviews, uh, trying to focus in this area. I don't know how you, how you market your your uh, your channel, but this area needs to get that message, and that's what I'm trying to do. And that's what, I, that's what I'm doing. That's why I do your interviews. That's why I go shake hands. But let me tell you, shaking hands is complicated because people, the second they know you're not a Democrat, they get really defensive. I mean, really defensive. And then I tell them, but up, I, I didn't tell you what party I was in, and you agreed with everything I was saying. But bam, the second they know it's a, it's a Republican, oh, <laughs> It's like it's it's like the Democrats have created a firewall, a, a mental firewall on people yeah. that when when you say the word uh, uh, Republican or, or not Democrat, that's it. <laughs> well, you know, that's why I start and I tell them, OK, look, I'm not going to tell you what party I'm from until the end. Let me tell you. You tell me if you agree with my ideas and then you can tell me. If I'm a Republican or a Democrat, or if you agree with me or not, and most people, pretty much everybody agrees with me. You know, they want to pay less rent, they want less regulation, they want to take more money home. You know, less taxes. One of my one of my proposals is no state taxes, but it's really not a congressional issue from the U.S. Congress, but it's a, a state thing, and that's how the other activities uh, come into play. So, you know, paying less state taxes, 
uh, less regulation, uh, less taxes in general, less government, but to the point where, you know, our lives aren't affected by a big corporation. And they support all of that, all of that. Then they, they tell me, okay, you're a Democrat. I'm like, no, I'm a Republican. And they're like, oh, my God. <laughs> they get all crazy. <laughs> but, you know, here in this district, uh, I was speaking to some people. People that are in poverty are paying up to 80% of their income in rent. Normal people, you know, I mean, that aren't in poverty, so to speak, uh, are paying up to 50% of their income in rent. So you're spending all your money on rent, utilities, and food. And you really, you're living paycheck to paycheck. And these people are making, like I said, you know, above $70,000, 80000 dollars $100,000. $100, and most of that money, like 90% of that money, goes into just basic needs, rent, food, uh, you know, whatever, medical. You, you know, know it's, it's really hard here. Housing expense guidelines, uh, it's uh, 30%. You, you, you cannot devote more, of, more than 30% of your income to, a house, to your housing expense. And with, with, with the utilities and everything, 50%. That's, that's max. But even, okay, think about this. 50% of your income, and, and this is part of the neoliberal model, 50% of your income has to go to your housing and your utilities. And remember, before President Trump, you were paying about 30 35%. In income tax. So just there, your 85% of your total income is already in taxes and in uh, your house and your utilities. Utilities are just more taxes, right? So you have 15% for food, clothing, your car, uh, whatever you need to do as a family. I mean, it's nothing. So we need to understand that we need to be keeping more of our money through less taxes in California. Uh, Texas is a great example. Look at the prices in Texas. Look at the food in Texas. I mean, you get so much food in Texas for like a couple of dollars. I mean, here you go anywhere. You're paying 20 bucks and you get nothing. I mean, honestly. So that's part of the problem. I mean, people here think that uh, it's normal to spend that much money on little return. And it's not. In other states in the country, the Midwest, the South, you realize how far money actually goes. Here you don't. I mean, here people are slaves to their job. They literally work just to survive. So they won't be out on the street, you know, most of them. And it, it's really a bad way to live because you live stressed 24-7. Uh, Ignacio, just to end here, something that I do a lot. Can you say in 60 seconds, two minutes, a message to Trump as a candidate in the Silicon Valley in, in California. President Trump, I need your endorsement. I am the only Trump Republican in this district and the only Trump Republican probably in all of California that openly campaigns as a Trump Republican. California has serious issues with the California GOP and we need support from our president if we want to turn this state red. We need your help. We need your power to come here. Like you're gonna be in Silicon Valley, I mean in uh, Bakersfield. We need you to take California into account much more than you have because we can rescue this state. We really can. And you can send more people to Congress from this state so that we can control Congress and so that you can legislate and dictate what happens in Congress, and we can remove Nancy Pelosi and the do-nothing Democrats and have a real agenda for this country. The, count, the country will thank you for it. The California people will thank you for it. And everyone that believes in this great nation will thank you for it. Please, Mr. President, support us directly. Thank you. <laughs> How was that? Awesome. Oh, was that good? That was great. That was great. <laughs> And uh, one to the Hispanic community. How how can the what do you want to tell the Hispanic community in sixty seconds, two minutes? Look, uh, I'm going to focus on the people from Mexico. Let me tell you, Mexico is a failed state. Yes, you love your country. Yes, you love the country of your ancestors. Yes, you love your culture, and so do I. 
But everything that happened in Mexico through the PRI, the PAN, and the entire corrupt system is what we're living right now in California through the Democratic Party. It's the same thing. They want people to depend on the party. They want people to depend on government so that they can stay in power. We need to remove the Democrats just the way in Mexico they're trying to remove the corrupt system. We need to correct the system here. Eliminate Democrats. Democrats do not care about you. They don't care about you I mean, in the least. They really don't. And you need to open your eyes or at least listen to other people from other perspectives and what they want to do for this state. Otherwise, it's going to be no better than Mexico in the next decade. Wow. Wow. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Marco. Thank you. I love doing interviews with you because they go on for like an hour. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, it's not 10 minutes. Eh, more than an interview, it's, a, it's un compartimiento. Yeah, yeah. It's like hanging out and, and talking. You know, that's really good. I love it. I love your show. Uh, I try to catch it as much as possible. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get together for Wednesday and see how we can get there. Yeah. Oh, when, when is it? It's Wednesday? Mm-hmm. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, I'm good. We'll drive or something. <laughs> All right. Sounds yeah. good. I'll All right. Out to you. All, All right. right. Absolutely. Thank you. Por, por su atención, muchas gracias. Uh, hasta pronto. Nos vemos mañana. Viewers of the True Channel and Mi Punto de Vista, My Point of View, this is Rufi Molina, and I'm here to go ahead and talk to you a little bit about Vivir Ganando. It's an online educational tool. We're here at the True Channel and at Mi Punto de Vista. We feel that the best investment you could ever make is in yourself. And how can you invest in yourself? This is through education. And Vivir Ganando is an online educational tool to empower you with the information in order to, for you to be the most successful optimum self you can possibly be. This is a $2,700 value educational package, but because you follow us at, here at the True Channel and at Mi Punto de Vista, my point of view, just for you, our viewers, if you click below and you subscribe, it's $45 a month you will not regret the greatest investment you can possibly make, which is in yourself. And at $45 a month, it's an amazing value. You are worth more than anything else. Vivir Ganando te ofrece la oportunidad de invertir de una forma inteligente. Jurek Vázquez, el director de este programa, ha eh, propuesto para toda nuestra audiencia que tú puedas acceder a un curso que es sumamente económico. Actualmente un curso de la Bolsa de Valores vale como $2,700 dólares. Él lo deja con una membresía solo de $45 dólares. Esta es tu oportunidad. Accesa el link que está abajo, por aquí, en algún sitio. Y entonces tú tendrás la oportunidad de vivir ganando. Rufi Molina here at the True Channel with Mi Punto de Vista.